thank you so much. So I'm going to be talking around customer expectations in the new digital economy. The fellow panelists that you see here today are people who actually believe in learning, a lifelong learning part that they continue to do. They love to look at themselves as individuals who look at uncharted territories and ensure that they keep them abreast on that. We have some who also look at parallels from mythology and how do they apply it to their businesses. So we have uh, Sachin who does that in a very interesting way. We have Shurveer who looks at uncharted territories and tries to ensure that he gets his domain expertise. And Amit over here has his quest for learning. What I really liked about Amit when I looked up the three senior people over here was the quest for learning and the humility and the way they work in with their teams. So when I'm going to start my conversation with each one of them, I'm sure it's going to be enriching because of the sheer love for learning that each one of them have talked about to me. So we are at this cusp of this digital revolution, which is Feb 3.0, and there are immense possibilities in and around that. Uh, since morning, we are talking about artificial intelligence, we're talking about extended reality, how blockchain technologies are going to make fundamental changes in the way the digital media is going to function. This new digital media, we feel, is going to be a lot more empowering. It is going to be inclusive with the aim to generate what everybody today talked about, decentralized experience and ownership. In addition, it's going to really create new systems for communication, finance, and entertainment. This is the one that's really going to impact all our, ex our consumers. With that, I'm going to start with my first very question. Shurveer, to you, what are the expectations that you have seen of this Web 3.0 consumer? Okay, so, you know, Anita, thank you. And as uh, being seen the transition from uh, Web in India to Yahoo's and Orkut's and then moving from Yahoo to Google, I think which was a big change from a media standpoint, right? Uh, how Yahoo started the entire journey of uh, selling media online and then how, you know, from the banner or the search ads, how we moved to Google and how they have been able to optimize. I think we are lucky that we have witnessed that and, and in our lifetime, hopefully we will witness the change from 2.0 to 3.0, right? Uh, but my personal experience is that, before I come to the customer expectation, is that uh, the, cha the change now is quite fast as compared to what it was when uh, during 90s or 2000, early 2000, when we saw how Yahoo moved to Google and how Google capitalized on the entire frame. Uh, the change from a business perspective at that time was that, you know, that's my personal theory, but I believe that uh, Yahoo at that stage could have easily bought down Google, right? Because Google was two doors away in one of the garages next to their office. Uh, that would have been great, right? If they would have thought Google as a tough competition. But today the change is that today all of us know that what is coming is might be a serious competition to all of us, right? Or it might be from a brand perspective or from technology perspective will be something better and we are so evolved to understand the importance of it. Like in last couple of months, the way ChatGPT or various AI models, which the way they have created the buzzword amongst the all marketers or brands, I think it is itself, uh, uh, you know, it's a, it is something which defines that we are open, more open as compared to how we were earlier in terms of accepting new things. Second, also one of the big changes in India typically, and I'll talk more India centric is that the mobile penetration has grown very rapidly and today I think there will be hardly any household will not be on a smartphone but the percentage of households on smartphones are quite high, access to uh, you know network speeds so or data is quite easy. I think we are the cheapest in the world in terms of data plans and with 5G added on that's going to further help the entire adoption of digital technologies. But what is, so there, there's going to be a change. We are figuring out as we are moving along that how we can use it and how we can monetize. Monetization is an important story uh, around using this technology and talking about 3.0 or whatever it will be called when it is in a full-blown shape. But uh, I am sure that today brands or organizations or on the corporate side, we are more open to accept it. Uh, we are more taking it 
as uh, something which will help us, aid us to make things better and faster. Uh, at the same time, today the consumer is more educated, they are more digital savvy, so the adoption is going to be faster. The expectations, obviously, you know, uh, one of the biggest expectation or if you call why people talk about it so much or why they adopt digital, in my personal view is convenience, right? And uh, today, till today, because of added convenience, there's a lot of digital adoption, but uh, there is a challenge. The challenge is of trust, right? Because at the same time, there are a lot of frauds and specifically I'm talking about financial space, but a lot of targeted frauds and communication frauds and what you call spams and stuff like that. But all that, if that gets channelized and eased out with this new technologies coming up, like for example, blockchain is quite secured. So if you are able to create speed and security, I think that creates trust in the digital world. Uh, you know, this is something what I personally quite believe that if when I'm creating a digital property and when I'm taking care of my digital business, I see that if I'm able to create speed, I'm able to create security, and I'm able to create convenience, I'm definitely creating trust in the end. And that is what I believe that this 3.0 will definitely deliver uh, from the consumer perspective. Consumers are curious, they are excited, they, they want to explore. Uh, just a random, you know, in my office when I talk to my people today, you know, in fact, my assistant, I, you know, day before I asked him that, uh, why don't you reply to this person, thank you for the invitation and stuff like that. I, I was just cross, crossing by and saw him trying to figure out a reply on chat GPT and I asked him, why, why are you doing it? You can just write a simple email. He said, no, I thought, let me understand if it works fine. Right? Now, now that's, that's curiosity to understand how uh, the AI can simplify things or if it can give you better answers, if it can improve your own skills to make, uh, you know, better communication. I think a lot of people uh, in India typically, you know, we, we, we need to improve on communication a lot, right? Because we have always relied on personal help, personal interpersonal communications, but uh, from a brand side, the communications need to improve to a larger extent. And if these technologies can help you communicate better with the customer, can if remove the clutter and can be more direct, can write, com can communicate in a way that the customer is able to get what he wants, uh, that will be quite beneficial uh, from that perspective. Yep. Thanks. I just Thank love the point that you talked about, a very important word, which is trust. The other one, the second one, which really actually works in is the security part, right? Because if I am going to be wanting to give my data, I want to be ensuring that I, I feel safe and secure with that data that I am sharing with somebody. Uh, if with the decentralized world in Web 3.0, I think that's one area which possibly will get uh, rectified when you have the peer-to-peer -peer network and it's not really sitting with a couple of, uh, you know, hard set of uh, partners like a Google or a Facebook only, and that's what will help. Coming to you, Sachin, what are your views on how you think this consumer 3.0 is really going to expect things from Web 3.0? So I'll, I'll just continue on that. So uh, what you summarized, or what Shurveer said, uh, you also use the term convenience. Uh, of course, uh, in banking we say convenience is like kind of inversely proportional to the fifth root of security, right? So the moment you increase convenience, there's somewhere some security plug moving here and there. But I think, uh, see the consumer expectations, uh, as in since the consumers came out of the cave, uh, they wouldn't have really changed. So whether it's Web 3.0, Web 33.0, <laughs> they need that convenience, they need that relevance, right? Searching for uh, a good hotel close to a Europa Park and you give me an Igatpuri, uh, uh, some uh, shady hotel, right? This happened a few days back. So uh, now in a, in, a, in a Web 3.0, pure privacy word, I don't think we are very anywhere close to that. We are not even at the doorstep. It could be Web 2.0. 114 as of now and there will be a lot of miles to cover. But in a full privacy word, in a cookie-less word, how do we ensure that uh, we, we give that convenience, we give that relevance? Uh, morning only we were sitting with uh, some research teams and uh, uh, we, were, we, were, we were asking a lot of customers, there was a qualitative research, uh, MSMEs, uh, what is the kind of content you need, right? So the exporters will say, I need that stamp duty, custom duty kind of content. The domestic guy would say, I need some bank guarantee related content, right? 
So now, how do you ensure that to that n is equal to one, you do that? Especially in a Web 3.0 kind of world, where you will have to respect all that privacy, and you'll have very limited tools uh, to kind of get in there. I think it's up to us uh, uh, to really figure out ways to do that. It's going to be a challenge. It's going to be a challenge. But I think uh, uh, we as uh, marketers, advertisers, we as business people have always figured out ways. So when somebody asks that email has not really worked on productivity, he or she definitely needs some tool for productivity en enhancement, right? So then what is next? So there is chat. There is uh, possibly a phone call, whatever. But what is the best relevant thing for the customer is what we'll have to figure out. And I think uh, through all the generations, we have kind of progressed there. So I don't see any reason to be too worried. Yes, uh, at every door uh, that's closed, uh, it's, it's good to be anxious and curious. If you're not, then uh, we aren't thinking enough, right? So we have a job ahead. I think we all will do a good job. Thanks, Sachin. It's nice. From 3.0 to 33, I don't know whether we're going to be there to see the Web 33 Point o. But yes, thank you so much for your views on that one. I'm going to bring it to Amit. Amit, what are your views on this? So, uh, okay. So I come from a very different industry. You know, I've been hearing the previous panel and this panel, uh, my co-panelists. Uh, I come from an industry which really got impacted uh, positively uh, over the past three years. That's online education. Uh, everyone's heard of... Uh, you know, a bunch of unicorns. Uh, but, uh, you know, what's really happened is uh, that, that it's opened doors, uh, you know, the pandemic has opened doors to, to really uh, using web, and I would now say web 3.0 as a leverage to our consumer experiences. Uh, to my mind, there are three or four factors really which, which uh, the consumer would expect, uh, really. You know, uh, Sachin and Shurveer have already spoken about data security. To my mind, that's, that's primary. There are two other aspects, and one of them is personalization. Right? Uh, you know, in, in our case, the consumer is buying education. You don't buy education, you don't consume education on a regular basis. Right? You, you probably go for a degree or a diploma once or twice in your lifetime, or maybe thrice in a lifetime. Uh, so the decision making is a lot more evolved. And what we are excited with when we look at Web 3.0 is, is real personalization of information, uh, of relevant information to our consumers so that he or she takes a decision. The second aspect, and I think that's also, uh, I've been hearing chat GPT, we've been all hearing chat GPT over the last few years, a uh, few months for sure. Uh, the key aspect here is interactivity. And imagine, uh, well, we are an education player, but I don't have people 24 by seven uh, manning phones, phone calls, etc. But imagine someone being able to do that job or part of that job. And I think that's, that's really, this. Uh, the third piece of the puzzle as far as Web 3.2 goes. And that's, to my mind, the three expectations that the consumer will, will have uh, with any brand that they interact with. Thanks, Amit. I think very important points. Uh, personalization, a lot of it was talked about in the previous panel as well. It's how we're going to use AI and machine learning to try and get to that right consumer. So a lot of action in that space is something which may be at the base level, but a lot of interesting technology understanding for getting to the right consumer cohorts. Uh, this change, this, you know, these opportunities for business to offer innovative market-based solutions, improve our customer experiences, will also obviously give your business growth and competitive advantage. Coming back to each one of you, two of you come from the BFSI category and one from, you know, the uh, education category. Uh, uh, starting with you, uh, Sachin, I just want to understand in your space, what, has had, what is it that has been done in the Web 3.0 space? whatever baby steps you've taken, and if at all, uh, what is it going forward, the plans that you're putting into place? And are there other categories that you take inspiration from when you want to understand, uh, you know, the space that is growing? 
So interesting, actually. In fact, uh, let me let me talk on behalf of the industry per se. Uh, see, the entire uh, e-com revolution, uh, and let me on behalf of the industry take credit for that, uh, was made possible not by cash on delivery, not by COD. Uh, I'm sure many of us out here would have experienced COD as the first thing and then moved to maybe uh, payments. But uh, banking in India uh, brought in that or rather made it possible, right? You could book an IRCTC ticket and not stand in the reservation center because that web 1.0 you call it, uh, but I call it web 33.0, uh, where you could actually make a payment. And that, that was one of the, the, one of the first things that uh, went online in this country was banking. Payments, let me not call it banking, but payments. What has, and banking is all about essentially payments, right? Uh, you, you don't need a bank if you're not paying anybody, right? Uh, and uh, for the smaller payments, uh, you will usually use your own money. And when it's bigger payments like buying a house and all, you need somebody to back, up, back you up and pay on your behalf. And that's where the second role of the bank will come in. So the first part, uh, Web 33.0, I just made that up, so, uh, right? Uh, no uh, royalties there, but so uh, that I think uh, we on the payment side, if if you have services, if any of our, of, of you are selling a bike on Metaverse, uh, the payment is there, right? You can pay it today as well, right? Uh, uh, through blockchain or otherwise, just that somebody has to sell a stuff and the payment is there. Uh, when it comes to the lending side of it, if you're buying a house on Metaverse, possibly I may not have a credit. A mechanism out there uh, and collections or other things uh, which are far more important for us so uh, that's where I think we have to get we, we are working on we are figuring out ways to kind of do that on the banking side of it uh, when it comes to acquiring customers uh, I think we are just waiting for the space to be there because uh, just having a bank out there on a metaverse on web 3.0 uh, with no underlying products being sold Right, uh, the consumers, uh, we we ourselves don't want to just acquire a lead per se. Right, come fill up a form. Uh, there is hardly any convenience. Right, you you don't have to want to kind of get onto a second life kind of an experience and avatar uh, filling up the same form that you otherwise could have just filled up on your phone or called up somebody. So uh, I think the day there are products available there, uh, there is e-com happening on. 3.0, uh, all of the bank, the, the payments industry per se will definitely be, be there. Uh, we are advanced enough to kind of manage that. And let me say that we are at far more advanced than what other banks are outside the country are. When it comes to the lending side, that's where, uh, as of now, we see a challenge. There are a lot of back, black boxes that we'll have to create in terms of policies. Uh, and uh, beyond that, I leave it on to the other banker. So, uh, Shubhi, you want to go next because I'd, I'd like the connection of the BFSI to continue and then I'll come to Amit. Yeah, very rightly said by Sachin, you know, they, uh, ICSI has always been a big investor on technology, right? Let me give that credit to them. They are usually one step ahead in terms of uh, putting money into it and they've got deep pockets to do it, right? And like we are a small finance bank, right? We, we, we try to focus on today more. And we have that catch-up game to play. But uh, on a serious note, the fact is what Sachin said is right, that on a payment side, yes, there is a complete readiness, there is a availability, all platforms. We are, in fact, better than majority of countries in the world on the payment side to acknowledge, adopt, and to adapt ourselves on that side. So I don't see any challenge on that side. But typically in terms of implementation, like something he mentioned about Metaverse. Now, I, I agree with him on Metaverse because uh, there are few, like I, I think JP Morgan uh, uh, had started an experiential branch or something like that on Metaverse. Then there was one Indian bank who also followed, I think. Union bank. Yeah. So, but the, my point is, what are you expecting the customer to go and do there? You are expecting him to go there and see things, figure out details, right? Which today, you just imagine that, that those, all those details are available to him on, uh, on the fly, on his mobile, in a very easy manner on your websites or through various uh, chatbots or stuff like that. So today, just by putting up an experiential zone in Metaverse is not going to add many value. 
Second, I figured out that you know, a lot of people were doing parties on Metaverse, right? That, and some concerts and shows. Sounds quite interesting. And definitely it feels nice. I also, in my curiosity, have participated in a few of them, understood. But the fact is that still, uh, how do you figure out the monetize? Because we are in business, right? We are in business. I can make the customer feel good and happy about it. And also one hard reality of life, and I respect all customer segments. Uh, let me say that with disclaimer. But the fact is that the the students or the millennials, the people who are in a range of between 15 years to 25 years, please understand they don't they don't contribute to the large part of economy in terms of monetization, right? So the the people who contribute or where the and we are in money business, right? So the fact is that the efforts have to be focused there. But yes, I think when you asked about what are the efforts what are being put in in the industry and uh, within is that we are trying to understand the space well. Uh, you know, we have understood what it takes to do all those things, but those decisions to make it happen uh, needs to take, needs to be taken when you can figure out that how you can actually make the experience of customer better. Like blockchain, there's a lot of work which has happened in the industry. Today, cross-border payments are operating on blockchain, right? ICSA was one of the leading banks to start that. Uh, all banks today who operate in the cross-border payments today are leveraging the blockchain technology on that side. It comes with its unique advantages. You know, all your NFTs and all, all, all those other things have their own space in the way the things are getting evolved. Uh, typically on the customer experience side or the communication side, I think uh, one thing which is a question to everybody always is about in that cookie-less world, how do you, you know, have more targeted communication because typically institutions were not able to profile customers well. Okay, so that is the effort which we have done a lot uh, in terms of profiling the customer well uh, because, you know, unfortunately like many other segments, uh, the good part is that the customer when he engages with a bank to, to do everything in his life since morning till evening, he has to pay and when he has to pay, he, that data gets captured with the bank. So, you know, we, we are more fortunate to have a lot of data uh, about the customer, his choices, you know, where he's spending, he's spending for what, uh, you know, in which location, which time during the day. And that allows us to have a much better engagement and communication with the customer. Uh, this is the area, I think, on which all banks, and typically we are working a lot, that how we can profile this data, analyze this data better to have more targeted and better communication with the customer or more engagement with the customer because we want the customer, uh, we want to talk to the customer. We don't want to inform him. And that communication to happen, there is a space to do a lot, you know, and that is where the focus is. And I think once that streamlines and fits in, then that makes those personalized communications, things which the web 3.0 has expectations much easier for us, right? Yeah. I'll, I'll just add one thing to the preparedness part. Uh, so the CBDC, the digital currency that all of you would have already heard of, is now a reality. Uh, some of us banks, I have already started that, uh, which is the currency for Web 3.0 possibly. Uh, and uh, in fact, I have my bank's app on my phone. Trust me, uh, another, give it three months and you would be paying uh, to, if not all, at least 10 to 15 percent of your daily payments will actually move to CBDC in three months. Thanks, that's interesting. Uh, should we talked about the target audience, which was a, a different one for the BFSI category. Amit, I think in your case, you do talk to the, the 15 to 25 as well from, a, from an education uh, point, and of course for the other courses, the higher set as well. So what is your point of view on it? So uh, thank you, Anita, for bringing that up. Um, well, we interact, uh, in, at least in our uh, online education space at NMIMS, we interact with audiences between 18 and 35, actually. Uh, our audiences are actually working professionals, which means uh, some of you in the room could be a target audiences for us. Now, uh, we have, you know, we, we don't come from large, uh, you know, corporate genesis. Uh, so we have a problem of a different kind. Uh, we do meaningful interactions. Last 2022, we would have done meaningful interactions with about uh, 4 million potential customers. And when I say meaningful, they would, these would be conversations anywhere between 15 minutes plus to uh, 60 minutes plus conversations. Uh, two, two serving consumers which are, uh, well, 
not not as large as BFSI, but about uh, 200,000 consumers who spend anywhere between 60 to 300 minutes on our app. Uh, these are paid consumers. Uh, so, so to to answer your question uh, from from my from the place that I am sitting at, uh, the consumer uh, that that will now evolve into a 3.0 consumer, if I have to call him that, uh, will will go through a very, very different journey and expectation. Uh, what are we looking at doing? Uh, well, we use today chat on our marketing side, uh, which is AI-led, uh, as well as on our uh, education-led app or our education delivery app. Uh, in fact, while I was coming in, our head of marketing just mentioned to us that you know, our campus today uses virtual tools and those are immersive. Uh, I just saw them on my way down and they're brilliantly immersive. Uh, these, some of these things and uh, what Sachin and Surveer also spoke about, personalization of advertising, uh, voice search becoming a very, very large trend, uh, NLP being, being uh, the focus there, uh, is, is going to drive more and more uh, marketing adoption as far as Web 3.0 goes. What I would also like to mention is, is on the product and delivery per side. And, and I think that's where we see Web 3.0 having immediate impact. You know, uh, let me give you a few examples. Uh, we're thinking, can we use chat GPT to take, to become a teaching assistant to some of our professors, right? Uh, can they handle mundane queries uh, or regular queries which can be answered by the chat bot or, or the chat really? Uh, I'll give you another problem that we're looking at solving. Uh, we today, you know, this December we did about 450,000 tests uh, in a three week period. Now, these are proctored tests. So we have a huge workforce of people actually proctoring and these are online tests, right? Now can we use AI, which is a web 3.0 tech, right? To, to really reduce the number of proctors, maximize the uh, use of tech to, to ensure, uh, you know, exams are proctored well. So some of those things are things that we're looking at. In fact, I was looking at, uh, and this, this is uh, a little dated as an example about 18 months ago, but Howard uses uh, an online classroom, which is very unlike a Zoom or a, uh, you know, a, a Teams meet. Uh, it's, it's almost as immersive as a classroom, like we are interacting here. So, so there are uh, very different use cases, at least in, in the sector that I'm in. No, I, I like the part, Amit, that you talked about, because your sector also has a target audience, which is taking that generational leap, wanting to be the first one into saying, okay, I went to that Metaverse concert, or I'm the one who's, you know, having that wedding, which is jamming with Dalveer when he's having a Republic Day concert kind of stuff. So it's interesting to see the kind of stuff that you guys are pulling in education and making it a lot more immersive will be interesting to the students that kind of come in. So that's great to see. I'm going to now move on to, you know, something of the Dentsu report that we called out when we were pulling in our presentations, where we called out three evolutions. We talked about the customer convenience and should we, you spoke about that a lot, you know, through the digital transactions. Just a couple of more pieces that you would like to add on UPI, Aadhaar, you know, all of these that are really, you know, the PTMs today, a whole host of people. Gentleman over said, I don't have a wallet on my, you know, in my pocket. I have, uh, you know, just the phone and it's doing everything for me. What more in customer experiences that you'll see with these digital transactions? So, uh, payments is a very revolutionary uh, space and what has happened uh, since 2000. 16 till now is, is something which is phenomenal. Uh, but, you know, if you see what e rupee, you know, CBDC Sachin was talking about some time back, uh, that's going to be interesting, right? Because currently there are few banks and it's been a pilot stage, but once it comes up, you know, it's, it's also a revolutionary step in India. But largely between NPCI and the regulator, uh, you know, RBI and the innovation hub, which they have set up, uh, I don't know, very few people know about it, but uh, there's a very large amount of importance goes to iSpirit, 
you know, I Spirit is a organization run by Sharad and uh, Nanda Neelkani and all. Uh, they believe in no greed, no glory kind of a concept, but this UPI took its birth there. Uh, today your ONDC, your account aggregator and all those things are principally something which have worked there. Now the focus, if you say in the India on the payment side is that uh, to democratize, what UPI was, was democratizing the payment space, right? Just provide APIs, people interact and use it quickly. Uh, you know, so all a lot of fintechs came up and they were able to use those APIs to make transactions simpler and easier. Uh, Similarly, like account aggregator is the big thing which people are working in the payment industry today. Uh, that is more to be used on the credit side. But again, that is again democratizing the entire data which is available between the banks and making it easily accessible to take credit decisions faster. So there's a lot and lot of work which is happening in India on this space. The entire objective is to make it more convenient. Like today morning, I was talking to the Visa team now for card issuing companies, UPI is a challenge, right? Because though on the credit size, the credit card still continues to grow because the penetration was too low, right, in the country. And still people need credit. And when they have to use credit to spend, they'll still use credit card. But credit card linking to UPI, which NPCI rolled out and the RBI announced in the last policy meeting was, again, a revolutionary change. Because once you link credit cards to UPI, then you don't need to carry physical credit cards also. Today, if you have to use a credit card, you carry a physical credit card. So credit cards will go away, physicality, right? Uh, once Visa and Master come on board, currently Rupe has been onboarded on the UPI linking to credit card. But the fact is that today, Visa team was talking to me about, uh, you know, tap your phone to pay. Now they are working on aggressively because they want to be in business. So they are saying a debit card, which is in your phone and uses NFC technology to pay on the terminal. So they, Tap your card is currently available with a limit of, you know, 5,000. But tap your phone to pay can be very interesting, right? Now, uh, so the entire payment industry and because of this democratization, what has happened is that all the young players who have got great ideas, who are there in the industry, they want to explore this entire startup ecosystem in the country, how it has evolved. This has allowed that the, not only the incumbent players who are the banks, typically, my, my dear friend sitting on the right, but uh, also the challengers like us can use, take advantage of the technology or the startups and fintechs take advantage of technology uh, to innovate, to become better. But I can assure you that so much is happening in the payment space and there are two, two core pillars around that. One is convenience and second, second is security because with the rise in all these digital payments is there is a considerable rise in the digital frauds which are happening, right? So, and like my personal saying is that uh, digital frauds are about uh, being in that hurry or greed or something that because of that, we feel we are quite intelligent, we'll not get cheated and we end up getting cheated because there is an entire community of people who are working across to figure out the loopholes and, you know, cheat people. But that needs to get plugged. That needs to get plugged, for that a lot of communication needs to happen, for a lot of, uh, you know, things needs to be built and the entire industry is working around that to make it more safer, more secured, make it more robust and more convenient. So you will see, I, th I think in the next five years, uh, not only there, but uh, within India, I'm, I'm sure in your report it will count that the number of digital families are going to double up in the next five years, not double up, it's going to be three times where we are today. And that digital first families movement is going to drive a lot of uh, change in India. Like, uh, sorry, I'll take a minute on this because it's very one of my favorite topics, but uh, my personal learning is that in India, there are many Indias, right? And what, what happens is that if you go to a cities in U UP, you have to understand that their people transact and operate into a different way, right? And if you come in cities, urban centers like Mumbai, and in, within urban centers also, there are different pockets which operate in different way and different customer behavior. Like a Dharavi operates into a very different customer behavior the way the uh, Nipensi Road operates in, right? So all that will unite in a way the digital transactions will happen over a period of time and that is going to change in the next five years because of the penetration of the technologies and mobile phones and the 5G supporting it and the, you know, more younger population becoming the earning population in next five years, all these 
uh, what you call geo-economic uh, situations, uh, how it changes. This entire uh, acknowledgement or acceptance of technology is going to change. And with that change parallelly, the work, all the work which is happening between all the ecosystem players on the payment side, uh, I, I personally believe it's going to be revolutionary on that side. Yeah. Thank you. Thank Sorry you for so a long much. answer. No, yeah. no worries. I'm going to, uh, you know, uh, come to you, Sachin, with a different perspective. If, if you looked at our second evolution, we were talking about e-commerce from emergence of the D2C companies and the platforms that are coming in. Not as a marketer, but as a consumer, when you go and pick up D2C brands or you're going directly to, uh, you know, these platforms to shop, what would you like to see from these companies to address you as a consumer? Not as a marketer, but you're a consumer now. So, sorry, I didn't get it. As in I'm saying the second evolution we talked about was that e-commerce is emerging with D2C companies. As a, as a consumer yourself, right. I'm sure you go to an Amazon and you go to any of the other places to shop as well. So as a consumer and not as a, let's say, advertiser, what do you look at from, from these guys which will, you know, make you happy saying here was a great customer experience that I got out of this platform. No, so, so we were discussing this uh, some time back, uh, something around it. And um, uh, end of the day, most of our discussions around how do we ease the payment process. Uh, I don't know how many of you have experienced Digi Yatra app or the Delhi airport. If you have experienced that, that's any which way web 4.0. Right. Uh, so what they do is they create that unique ID of your boarding pass and your identity, ID card. And uh, even the CISF guy is now a transparent fellow, right? You walk through him, right? There's absolutely nobody to... So now, now this, it's for a limited purpose. So what, what I'm assuming they have done, I've not spoken to them, is from the time that you create that unique ID, it's, it's got a life of say, 20 minutes, 30 minutes or whatever, till your flight takes off, right? And then you get a seamless experience. Now, uh, transpose this across to any damn thing. Walking into a shopper stop, walking into uh, a virtual Amazon gallery or banking, restaurant, whatever. You walk in, you walk out. And now, if there you can marry a fantasy word, then the dhaba across my office one of the not so fancy places. My colleagues also hate to go there. Just that he's from my hometown, so I go there. And he doesn't have a fancy experience, but serves one of the best chicken in town. You know, next time I'll take you there. So, uh, if you can get an AR experience there, right? You walk into the dhava and gets you. I'm just taking as an example a digi yatra kind of a thing, which has a, so you have your digital currency married onto your Aadhaar and some unique ID with the menu of that place, you walk in and the ambience suddenly changes to the uh, uh, Khyber kind of a experience, a South Bombay experience. You walk in, you get the best of your table, your table also looks like that and uh, the plate even looks like that and you, you, you come out. I, I think all of that is possible. It's, it's definitely not fantasy, that's, that's what I expect as a consumer, and that's what I expect to create like a marketer. I love that example. In fact, I, I did tour the Digi Yatra last time when I was flying in from Delhi, and like you said, it was a wonderful experience. So we do hope a whole host of us try using those experiences. I'm going to leave the last part to go because we are uh, almost on time uh, for closing of the panel. So Amit, last thoughts from you on this, please. Uh, very quickly, I think uh, Web 3.0, we we're just at the tip of the iceberg. This is really the tip of the iceberg. Uh, the experiences are going to get more immersive, uh, really, really more immersive. The other day I was in Hyderabad and walking by a, in a mall and I saw these 18 to, I would say, 50-year-olds all sitting in a gaming zone with their virtual reality goggles. And the excitement in that small... 20 seater kind of a virtual reality gaming zone was brilliant. So I think we are really at the tip of the iceberg. Thank you. I'm going to take just three words out of the entire session, which I found, uh, you know, went and resonated very well with me. Convenience, 
security, immersiveness. I think these were the three highlights of the larger conversation that we really talked about. Thank you, gentlemen. It's been an absolute pleasure and privilege to host this panel. Thank you so much.